It's another hot, hot, hot episode in hot, hot, hot August. Woo! How's everybody doing? Did you listen to episode 85, Breach Without Borders? Because if not, I want you to rewind and start there. This is a series about breach birthing. And today's episode is with Allison. She is, I don't know, she's everything. She's one of my best friend's best friends. So you know how that goes, right? Like she's sort of like your best friend by default because she loves the person that you love the most. That's Allison. And she had a breach birth in Hawaii. That was a giant surprise. Can't wait for you guys to hear this amazing story. But I really want you to start with episode 85, where we talk about the safety of breach birthing. Enjoy. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does a day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. Okay, before we get started, I have a couple of reminders. The first, if you are pregnant and you are seeking more information, I have a ton of free guides for you at birthstory.com. Click on the tab, the workbook. All you have to do is put your email address in and you have access to my whole library. These are all of the documents that I share with my private doula clients. So if you're interested in learning more about delayed cord clamping, cord blood banking, placenta encapsulation, what the epidural procedure is like, download all my free guides at birthstory.com. While you're there, I would love for you to pick up a copy of the Birth Story Pregnancy Guidebook. It's a 42-week, week-by-week guide to your pregnancy. It has 42 journaling prompts, lots of birth affirmations, 42 birth stories, and it tells you everything that's going on inside of you from your baby's perspective. You can get $5 off and free shipping and a free gift by using code BIRTHSTORYPODCAST when you check out. Last but not least, if you are a fan of this podcast, then I just ask that you push pause and leave me a five-star review. I don't know how all the algorithms work, but I know that the reviews help other parents find their way to my podcast. I appreciate you. I appreciate you listening, and I would really appreciate a review. Thanks, and enjoy this episode. Hey, Allison, welcome to the Birth Story Podcast. I'm so happy you're here to talk about breach birthing. This episode is following, we just heard from Breach Without Borders on why breach birthing is safe and how the providers in this country are wildly undertrained and how to perform a vaginal breach birth safely. So, You're a great follow-up, Allison, because you had a beautiful breach birth. Spoiler alert, everyone. And we're just going to hear Allison's story today about how everything unfolded with her daughter, Jade. So Allison, before we get started, can you just share a little bit about who you are and some special things about you? And if anyone wants to reach out to you about breach birthing, how they can get a hold of you. Hi, I'm so happy to be here for starters. My name is Allison. I am a mother of two. I do have a very special birthing story that I do feel really seems to coincide with what you were just talking about right there. I am a massage therapist. I've been doing that for about 15 years. And I suppose if anyone wanted to get a hold of me, 
My email is AA Armor, which is A R M O U R at hotmail.com. So it's A A A R M O U R at hotmail.com. Awesome. I wanted to put that out there because inevitably there are people that are going to be listening to this podcast that find out at some point in their pregnancy that their baby is sitting upright. And sometimes it's nice to have somebody to reach out to, to just bounce some things off of. So let's back your story way up. I know that you're a mom of two and Mm -hmm. this pregnancy and birth that we're going to talk about is your first, your inauguration into motherhood. (laughs) And so tell me, where were you living at the time? I was living in Kona, Hawaii, which is on the big island of Hawaii. Ooh. um, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone just got super jealous. (laughs) (laughs) It was not a bad place to be a mom. And yeah, yes, I'm not there anymore, but it it was a lovely place to live. Yes. So you're in Hawaii, which, where are you from? Where did you grow up? I'm from Pensacola, Florida in the Panhandle originally. Okay. So you're pretty, you're pretty far away from home at this point. Did you have a big support network in Kona? I feel like at the time I didn't have a ton, but I still had what I needed, you know, and the way it works when you live in Hawaii is that you hear people talk about Ohana. I mean, family, when you live so far away from everyone and really people don't get how far out in the middle of the ocean you are, you end up making your own family. And that's what I did. So I did have a handful of people, especially I was in a birthing class and there were a couple of girls that I ended up becoming best friends with through that process. And we all had our babies about two months apart. So I was the last of a group of four women. So they were all wonderful to me and took care of me as well. So yeah, I had a little, just what I needed. Yeah, that's amazing. Did you plan your pregnancy? My first was not planned. My second was, yep. My first was not planned. I was on birth control too, but I was not being being good about it though. You know, I would probably take like three (laughs) at a time (laughs) when I realized I'd missed them and things, you know, so... Well, pills were not working for me. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a lot of alternate methods, everyone who's listening, right. but you scared me for a minute and everyone else listening because it's always those stories where you're like, yeah, Ooh, the IUD migrated or I forgot four pills or, you know, I know. The, I, know. Um, I know I have the IUD now and everyone scares me about it. But <laughs> there's five of us and my mom had several more pregnancies than the five of us. And she was like, yep, was on birth control for all of them. Yeah. So, oh yep. <laughs> I'm like, oh, guess you didn't take it very good either. Yeah. So this was a surprise. So mm-hmm. how old were you? 25 when I found out that I was pregnant. Okay. Yeah. So 25, married, yeah. living on the big island. And yeah. happy, you, excited. Okay. But not, but not planning. <laughs> not planning. Okay. Yeah. So how did your pregnancy go? Oh, perfect. I would never had any morning sickness, anything. It was a very, very healthy pregnancy. Awesome. You are so yeah. lucky. The <laughs> last like probably four interviews I've done, I had mom say like, I didn't even know I was pregnant. Really? And then I'll, like the fifth interview will come like the next one and it'll be like she had hyperemesis gravidar, oh, you know, and just I sick the whole time. So you had this beautiful, I just can imagine being pregnant in Hawaii. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, yeah. it's walking on the beach. Yep. It was just, just giant belly and bikinis and I just rocked it. <laughs> yes. And you felt great. So yeah. tell me like, what was your, you went to this birthing class, but you're 25 mm-hmm. years old and it's your first. Mm-hmm. And we all have to ask ourselves this question when we're on our first. What do we not yeah. know? What do we want? Mm-hmm. And you start to get you to know your body Mm-hmm. in a whole new way. It's an awakening of yes. mother, you know? And so I just was a little bit curious about as your pregnancy went on, what kind of thoughts and feelings, like were you under midwifery care or gotten like an OBGYN? I had an OBGYN, but I was sent to, from her probably, could they were good friends to a nurse midwife. So she was a nurse at the hospital where I was going to deliver, but she was also a midwife. And she was very holistic. And so I came into her birthing class. And I remember the first day she was like, show of hands, who's going to like get an epidural? And I was like, hey, you know, (laughs) me. 
you know, she, over the course of it kind of changed my mind. So in the beginning, I definitely had like a vision of what it would be like. And over the course of going through her stuff, I I did change my mind on a lot of things as I learned and made decisions for myself. So I did end up, you know, taking some of her advice and she ended up being in the hospital that day too, which was lovely. So I had a lot of personalized care with her as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you were planning a hospital birth. Yes. And I I was on the fence back and forth, but I felt confident knowing that I had I knew she would probably be there at some point while I was there. And although I wanted a little bit more of a natural birth, my OBGYN was also on board with that. So mm-hmm. I felt and I don't have a fear of hospitals or anything like that. So I felt that with all of these people around me that I would be comfortable and happy that way. And it was, it was good. It was a great experience. Awesome. Mostly. <laughs> so Hawaii does things a little bit differently. Okay. Yes. I know that, especially medically, it is a little bit more mm-hmm. holistic all around. And yes. I'd say less interventions and a lot of things. Yes. So were you getting like here, like in the what, what do we what do we call the main United States? The mainland, like yeah. The mainland. I'm like, okay, yeah. here in the mainland. <laughs> There's like, we are so ultrasound happy. It's like, is your baby head down? Is your baby head down? How much fluid is there? You know, you know, sometimes it's nice as a, as the parent because you're like, oh, fun. I get to see right. my baby. The FDA has put out these warnings that have said like, you know, all extra or unnecessary ultrasounds could be damaging or harmful to your baby. So don't do them. And so I'm just sort of curious because we know like the punchline here is that Jade was a breach, but like, at what point was she breach? Well, I mean, I guess we'll just get on right into it. Yeah. (laughs) I knew she was breach for a long time, but what I'll say about what you just said is that is what I encountered with, which was because we were doing things a little more naturally. My OBGYN was cutting out the extraneous ultrasounds. And so she would, you know, feel around and palpate and she felt that the baby was in the correct position, which is fine. But, you know, a mama ultimately kind of knows. And so it was like, there's this really hard spot right under my ribs. And she's like, oh, it's just her butt, you know, and I'm like, okay, you know, I've never done this before. So I did not know that she was breech until I was five centimeters and like, Oh, like and like in on. labor. Yeah, I was in, I was in like active labor. Okay. So <laughs> I was in a tub and they saw a meconium. And of course it was like, all right, out of the tub, let's see what's going on, you know? And then it was like, oh, her butt's just right there. So hey. no worries about the meconium, but guess what? You're breech. Okay. I have so <laughs> many questions when we get yeah. to that part of your birth story. Whoa. <laughs> Okay. So you didn't have these extra ultrasounds to like check fluid and to like make sure head was down. And I will say, I belly map all the time. It is very difficult for me to tell the difference between a head and a butt in many midwives and obstetricians that are really great at their trade, get it wrong all of the time. I have been like over the last couple of months, even we have gone with my doula clients to the hospital. They're in the middle of labor. And I've had some of the midwives say like, you know what, I'm just going to do a quick ultrasound, like like literally five second ultrasound just to check head down when they just weren't totally sure with a vaginal exam. I love where we're going with this story because I do think that there are, I am a fan and a proponent of breech birthing and you happened upon it, it sounds yeah. like. I was mm-hmm. very curious if this was like a conscious decision, you know, to not have a cesarean section and to do this. Before we get too far down that road, the number one question I get on this podcast is, and from my dual clients is, how in the world do I know that I'm in labor? So (laughs) could you kind of walk through like how you knew, like from your birthing class and what they told you a contraction felt like and all that, how did you know? Like, how'd you know, ooh, I'm in labor? Yeah, I mean, I think I probably had a few times where I thought it was and it just didn't progress. So, I mean, the one thing I remember her saying was like, if you're actually in labor, nothing that you do is going to like, you know, really stop it once it's really ready. I remember doing a lot of like squats and lunges and stuff because I really wanted to like keep it going. (laughs) I was like, let's do this. 
But yeah, I mean, obviously it felt like cramps and, you know, you have that little bit of fear in the beginning because you don't know what it's going to feel like. So it's a little bit scary, but ultimately, especially with the first one, I was so excited and I didn't know what to expect. Whereas with the second one, because I did have two natural births, there's a little more fear of like, I'm not ready to yeah. do that again. You know? <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I just remember being like, I, I mean, you're pretty, you're pretty sure. Oh, you know what though? My water broke. My water broke first with Jade. Okay. And so you had a couple false alarms. I had some false alarms. Yes. And then I, 7am, I was brushing my teeth and my water broke. And then I, unfortunately, in hindsight, it, you, you learn, right? In hindsight, I wish I hadn't gone right away because I didn't start labor but I called the hospital and they said like, you should come in, your water broke, you know, the whole story, like, you know, yeah. bacteria, whatever. And once I got there, they weren't even, my, the head was like blocking any more fluid. And so when she tested me, she didn't even like get any fluid from the little litmus test or whatever they do. Yeah. And of course me, I'm like, no, no, it, it did like, you know, and she's like, well, walk around a little bit. And if you feel like another gush or whatever, come back. And so I did, I was like walking <laughs> laps around the hospital but I was like begging them to let me go, right? Like, can I please leave? And once I was there, they're like, no, you know, you have to stay now. So it was hours of not being in labor. But eventually I did feel more and go in and they tested and knew that, you know, for sure my water Water was broken. Very important for everyone to hear this. There is a form at every hospital that is AMA, against medical advice. Right. If you want to leave the hospital, ask for the AMA form. And it says like, I understand you don't want me to leave and I am going to release you of all legal responsibility when I choose to leave this hospital. So in retrospect, like if I was your doula, I would have been like, hey, let's get the AMA form and get out of here. But no, I just want to, sure. that's why we have a doula. Yep, yeah. I'm like, this is why we do this podcast, right? To like teach yeah. the ones that go behind us, you know? Absolutely. Uh, there were so many things that I didn't know that first time. And, you know, you, you learn later. Yeah. Yeah. So you're there. And were you dilated at all at that point? Probably just a little bit, not okay. a ton. So, so like, not a lot of activity going on. Okay. So not a ton of contractions or anything mm-hmm. like that. No, okay. like not. And no one was like, Hey, that like even the fingertip dilated. I think I'm pushing on a butt. Okay. No. <laughs> nope. Okay. So tell me about how it started to unfold then. Okay. okay so they came in after a few, because I think that my water broke at seven. By about 11, they came in and, you know, were giving me my options for progressing. And I had already, you know, I had learned all about these things. And so I didn't really want the... Oh, it's been too long. Pitocin, um, Cervidil, Pitocin, And Heidi, I can't remember the name of what they gave me, but I remembered that my midwife, my birthing coach had told me about another one that was a little less aggressive and it's inserted. Evaginally. Evaginally, yes. Okay, so, so it would have been two things. So it would have been either a balloon catheter called a, at the time a Cook's catheter, or it would have been Cervidil which is a prostaglandin, that one. Okay, and that softens your cervix and helps it to dilate. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we did that around 12 and they told me that most likely it would take a second round before things got going. But the moment that they did that, I was in action. Wow. Yeah. You just needed like a whiff of prostaglandin. Yeah. (laughs) That's amazing. Okay, so when you say like get going... Okay. What'd you do? So now you're like, you want to have an unmedicated birth, right? You've made this plan. What were your coping mechanisms? Like, what'd you do? Honestly, I had a lot more coping mechanisms with my second birth. I did bring like a visual, like a a picture of the beach that I loved. It was like a, a painting of, you know, a palm tree at a beach where I was like proposed to, you know, whatever, a, a painting that meant a lot to me. I had my partner there, but ultimately skipping to that and going back and forth, I was like kind of out of body, not really there. (laughs) So your body just took over. So yeah, sometimes, you know, at the end, because I, from the time that it started around 12, where I started to get heavy contractions, I then took baths, which is when we found out I was breached. I was in the bathtub. So I did. I did warm baths. I had a ball. I was laying on a ball. I definitely didn't have all the amazing things that I 
see that you do, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I had my partner, I had a little bit of massage help and yeah, the warm bath and the ball it was more like that, a little more movement, but. And that's all you need. We overcomplicate it. Like even me as a doula, I come with this giant suitcase and I have like all these things and I end up only using like four of them. Like we really try to overcomplicate birth a lot. It's really primal. It's really mammalian. It's really like your body sends you out into the universe and you return a few hours later. So you're there, you're safe, you're comfortable, you're in the bathtub and your baby is basically pooping, which is what meconium is, into the water. And what we would have seen is something that was like a dark brown or a dark yellow or green coming Mm -hmm. out in the bathtub. So they ask you to get out of the tub. Yes. Yeah, so and, I'm not sure I saw it. I was busy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were like, okay, like, let's, let's get you on the table and exam, you know? So they yeah. did an exam, they did an ultrasound and immediately said, okay, she's breech. And you're yeah. five centimeters. Five centimeters active labor. And, you know, it's interesting because everything I had ever heard, even really, you know, I, unless I just wasn't listening in my birthing class, I thought that was an instant C-section sentence, right? I was like, oh boy, here we are, you know? And I had the fear of being, having a really bad labor that lasted like two days and then ended in an emergency C-section anyway, right? Yeah. So I immediately remember, and of course I'm like panicking. (laughs) I said like, just cut me open, right? Like that's what you're going to end up having to do anyway. And I'm not really thinking straight. And my doctor, who was amazing, I don't remember where she... I want to say the Bahamas. She essentially had done a ton of breech births out of the United States with programs, you know, to help low-income families in different countries. And so she said to me, hang on, anyone at five centimeters in active labor would say that. Like, I feel that you can do this. We can do this naturally. Take some time to talk with your husband and Ultimately, you know, if you decide you want to do it, I I feel that you can do this and it will be okay. Ugh. And so we talked for a minute and yeah, I know. And Let's I feel just... so blessed that I had the decision. Yes. I'm like, can we just, I just need to simmer there for a minute yeah. like, and make sure everybody heard that. That's what needs to be heard all of the time, all over the world. But first, like we just lis- listened to and learned in the episode before with Breach Without borders, your provider was trained and had experience. And like, that's the big piece that's missing is like, you had choice. You could have still said like, you know what, that's too something for me, right? Like, I'm not into that. And we're done here. And I elect for my body to have a C-section, but it's your first baby. No OBGYN loves to do a C-section on a first baby. We don't know how large anyone wants to play in their family. And you don't want to be doing five, six, seven plus C-sections. That's not safe for anyone. I'm so proud of your doctor. I'm just like, oh, I wish I had heard that over and over again through all of my years as a doula because I have had to support women through so many what I feel are unnecessary cesarean sections. Whoa, amazing story, right? I was just jumping in to interrupt really quick with a couple of reminders. Again, you can pick up all my free guides at birthstory.com. You can get $5 off the birth story book by using birth story podcast. When you check out, that also gives you free shipping and a free gift. If you are loving this episode, I say you start at the beginning. Start on episode one and go on a journey with me, letting me be your virtual doula and guiding you through this pregnancy. And if you are loving the podcast, I ask that you share it and leave a five-star review on whatever podcast player you are using. Today, I celebrate you. So now let's get back to this episode. So... You had to take a minute, I'm assuming, and be like, hold on a second. Yeah. We didn't train for this in our birth class. So it was crazy. I mean, I felt at that time, I still 
was in my right mind. And we talked about it calmly and ultimately I trusted her and I felt comfortable and it was like, okay. So we didn't talk long. It was like, let's do it. Okay. So I trusted her and we proceeded. Yeah. Okay. So she is also, Jade is presenting Frank breach, which is butt first rather yes. than like footling breach or whatever. So that's a really important part of this also. That is the safest of all the data that we have for breech birth. I mean, that's just the most ideal presentation is the butt presentation. And so, I mean, what next? I mean, were you like, I guess I'll get back in the tub? I mean, what'd you do? I don't remember if I got back in the tub or not. I may have stayed in the bed. I stayed in the bed for probably the rest of it. And as I said before, once I got towards the end, I was really tired because I, I had her at about 9.30 at night. So when all was said and done, it was still a long day. Yeah, Probably 14 about nine hours. hours of labor. Yeah. Yeah. So towards the end, I, you know, falling asleep in between contractions, you know, just very out of body, just exhausted. And, but yeah, so I think I stayed on the bed for the rest of it. Definitely, you know, was not feeling, <laughs> you know, it, it was painful, but completely manageable. And I remember, well, I had a, a pact with my husband that if I asked for an epidural three times, he needed to like get it for me, right? Okay. Like you can try to coach me through because obviously it's pretty natural to sort of have that fear, but I never asked for it once. So I was okay. And, you know, a little not present. <laughs> it's good um, because your body yeah. is being flooded with natural freaking yeah. opioids. And if you just yes. let yourself get drugged, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, addicts will say that like birth is a freebie, you know, or recovering mm -hmm. addicts, I should right, say. Right, right, right. <laughs> like recovering addicts. It's a freebie. I mean, it's a yeah. great high if you'll let yeah. your body like get flooded with these drugs. So you did. Yeah. You like, you know, launched off into la la land. I think I've yes. said this on the podcast before, but there's a saying that says like our soul travels out into the universe and goes and gets the soul of our baby. And then we travel back. And then you have this awakening when you're ready to birth. Yeah. You know? And I think it's so beautiful. So yes. you friggin' rocked it. You're just like, Frank <laughs> breach, no medication. And you're totally surprised by this, like, I'm going to air quote, like diagnosis or information because right. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what else to call it. So tell me what it's like to like, push? Did you get that fetal ejection reflex with like where you had that overwhelming urge to push or bear oh, yeah. down? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> once they had me all set up and we had made the decision and it was closer to time, she brought in the anesthesiologist and she just basically said, we're going to give you an IV. We're going to do all this stuff on standby in case we need to do an emergency C-section. I have a cut to though, because this is really important. Like a big part of my story was that it got like really dramatic during, but I did not know until afterwards. So we had a traveling nurse from Georgia. And I feel like it's kind of like what you say. I feel like the main piece of the puzzle is that she was younger and my OB was older. She was about to retire. And so she had not been taught about natural breech birth. And she was like losing her shit. And my husband came in to see me. And on the way back in, this nurse had cornered my doctor and was yelling at her that she was going to deliver a dead baby. And that was what my husband heard right before I started pushing. Yeah. Oh my she didn't God. believe that I should have had the choice. And she was like going off on her and telling her she was going to get her fired and just all this horrible stuff that luckily I did not know about until later. And she came in cool as a cucumber and I just never would have known that she was going through such a horrible thing. But yeah, it was really awful. Really and, awful. Yeah. And I'm sure that, you know. And uneducated, frankly, just uneducated, yeah. right? There is so much data out there on the, there, there are risks with, there's risks with a C-section. Newsflash, everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But the risks and the benefits for, especially for a first time mom, I love your OB because she was older, she was wiser, she was experienced. Oh, I'm so sorry that this, you know, everyone deserves a voice and to speak up. So I don't want to feel like that nurse's voice should have been silenced, you know? So I, but there's a time and a place, right? Like, right. you know, maybe like afterwards. <laughs> so Yes, yes. Exactly. But I guess she was trying to stop what was happening, right? Yeah. Ultimately, 
feel like I can always see both sides and I understood where she was coming from. And it was a very tense situation, you know, where she felt like it was life or death. And she felt like she was advocating for me, right? Mm -hmm. With what she knows and what she feels is best. She was trying to help me in her own way. I'm not sure I even never met her. That's the weirdest thing. I don't know what she looked like. You changed her life, though. If she was a young, new nurse, the trajectory of her career was forever changed. And knowing that baby was born perfectly healthy. But your husband at the time was privy to all of that. Thank God you weren't. Oh, man. Oh, I'm just glad your space was protected so that you could keep doing the hard work. So they have this IV going. They've got you. That's fine. You know, here they would, I would, they'd probably just put you right in the operating room just in case. I literally don't even know in my city if you can decline. Like if you can say no, like what would happen? I'm like, would they have to like get a judge? It certainly seems that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. And, you know, again, like you said, everything's different in Hawaii. That is another issue is that on the outer islands, being anything besides Oahu, which has, you know, a very large city and it's just well equipped with a big hospital. If you have twins, if you have anything, they they ship you to Oahu because they just are not equipped for any sort of emergency anything. Yeah. They just aren't as equipped. I think there's obviously a fear of that as well, that if it had gone really wrong, you then have to fly us to Oahu. So yeah. Were you you scared at all? Or were you like, I can do this. My doctor told me I could do this. I'm fine. Yeah. I don't think I was scared. I think in the the moment that she said I was breaching, I I was probably more scared of the C-section. And that's what I always said about the epidural too, is like, Yes, it was my choice, but a lot of it was the fear of the needle. Like, I'm like, I would just rather have this baby than you put that giant needle on my back. Like, no, you know, so I think there was a big fear of the C-section overall. But once I had made that decision, and again, I was a little out of body as well. You're just sort of doing it, right? So there wasn't fear after that initial just realization of what was going to happen. Yeah. Okay. You were fully tapped into that power. So I'm assuming like you're having contraction, you're having contraction. And then like my experience as a doula is that one contraction, you're like, and you just start and you just so, start like, yeah, pushing. You asked me earlier and I got off on the subject, but yes. So basically everyone was out of the room and I believe my anesthesiologist was in the room with me, probably just like talking to me, checking on me. And all of a sudden I was like, I'm going to push. And I was like yelling to the hallway. I was like, I'm going to push. And there was no stopping me. And I literally like yelled at my anesthesiologist. I was like, hold my leg. (laughs) I was not stopping. I was like, this is happening now. Like I I laughed in hindsight so often when you would hear people say like, you know, they're going to ask you to like hold on or whatever. And there was just no way, I guess, maybe if I had tried, but In that moment, I refused to try. I was like, I'm pushing now. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think there's a way to stop it. I equate it to like severe diarrhea or vomiting. Like if (laughs) diarrhea is about to squirt out of your ass and someone is like, don't diarrhea, you would be like, what? Like, it's just coming, you know? It felt so primal (laughs) and so out of my control completely. I laugh so much. I've been in so many births where they've been like, Stop pushing, stop pushing. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, it's a yeah. waste of words, you know? I'm like, there's that's there's no possible way to stop pushing. It's insane. I've even like been in ones before where they were like the nurse was in there, but like there was no midwife or OB. And like, I'm like, whatever. Nurses are great at delivering babies. Yeah. You know, babies come and and the nurses are like, Okay, take a deep breath, take a breathe through it. And the mom's like, okay. You know, like down. It's like, no, you cannot. So did you push for a long time though? No. no. Okay. 10 minutes. I've heard that breach birthing does happen much quicker than with a head down presentation. Okay, so 10 minutes. So you had that primal fetal ejection. I got to push my baby out right now. Now I'm super curious. Do you even know if like she was like her back was to your belly or if her back was to your back? Like was she sitting facing the world or facing your back? Do you know? I think she was facing my back. 
Okay. I think she was facing my back. Okay. I'm trying to imagine the birth as we're talking about. I know. About. So she's like I sitting. wish that I had had a mirror or something. Yeah. I don't know that I would have been present enough to, you have know, seen it. take it honestly. No, but yeah. you would have had your eyes closed. Everyone who asks <laughs> for the mirror looks for like one second and then they just close their eyes and push. <laughs> so she's folded in half, basically like in pike position, but out. Feet at her ears. Yeah. And then her, so she's facing your back. I'm assuming that when she's birthing, her butt's coming out and then then they're delivering her back and head yes. feet last. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I was trying to think of how she would have unfolded. Okay. So that yes. makes perfect sense. So that's actually like the optimal or ideal like breech birth position, you know? That's good. Yeah. So this is amazing. So 10 minutes. Now, the second thing that people think about with breech birth is tearing. <laughs> so... Okay. And yeah. especially with 10 minutes of pushing, you know, like, yeah. I mean, it, to me, I'm like, whoo, you blew it out. But like, maybe you didn't, you know, maybe that butt was stretching your perineum for like a really long time. You know so. what? The butt wasn't my doctor was. She stretched me oh, she did. continually Amazing. and I did not tear at all. Hell yes, Allison. <laughs> yeah. Look at you. I mean, I, I mean, this this is like a magical, powerful woman. I mean, what a blessing that you had. Yeah, like, I mean, she was wonderful. I mean, welcome to Hawaii is, yeah. you know, <laughs> and welcome to an educated physician. So yeah. that's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And she birthed both of my babies and retired like right after my second. Perfect, so. right? Mm -hmm. And loved on all the women that came before you too. That yeah. paved that way. Like, I like to think about it. Like, think of all those women that had breech births that yeah. gave you that opportunity with her, you know, which is really, really cool and, and so amazing. So she kind of, they unfolds as she's coming out and she comes, does she get to come right to you with the meconium? Or is she taken um, away? I honestly don't think that there was, much, you know what? I guess they could have wiped her off because she was breech and she was so folded in half. They did not hand her right to me. Her legs were out of the sockets. She was okay. So they had to tend to her for a minute. So there was, I remember, a moment of panic. I didn't hear her cry right away, you know, where it's like, is she okay? And then they did bring her to, to me. And uh, I know obviously my doctor would have if she could. And she did with my son. In fact, I had like a sports bra off and she was like, take your bra off, you know, like I'm going to put this baby on your chest. So you know, yeah. I didn't have it immediately with Jade, but they were busy with her and then she was okay and they gave her right to me. A lot of times with meconium, they will take the baby right away because when the meconium is in the amniotic fluid, like inside of you, babies are practice breathing. So they're breathing in and swallowing. So a lot of times they'll be born with that um, meconium in their lungs and in their stomach, and that can cause an infection. So like the first thing they like to do is just kind of suction. And when babies cry, like ah, they're yeah. working it out themselves. But I know a lot of times, like, I just want to make sure I at least say that, that like if meconium is present, it's okay, you know, but there are tools like suctioning the lungs and the belly and getting stimulating your baby to cry so that right. we can get all that meconium out of there so that you're newborn doesn't end up with just, a, you know, a lung infection or something right. that, could, mm -hmm. that could hurt her. So you said the legs were out of the socket. That's pretty common because right. for her whole development, basically, she was probably sitting. I mean, More she's probably that. really flexible with yeah. yoga, you know, <laughs> touching her toes these days. Did you have to do any PT or chiropractic care to unfold her? She was in a, a harness for about okay. the first four, uh, nine months. Okay. And it was, in hindsight, it seems like it was a lot less scary than it was in the beginning, you know? So there was an organization called Shriners, and that was in Oahu. And from my knowledge of them, they primarily offer help to burn victims and like bone issues. So they would fly us over to Shriners Hospital once a month. And in the beginning to like see everything and because their bones haven't ossified, they would do ultrasound on her little hips. And they did, they put her in a little harness that just looked like little white velcro -y booties and that had straps that would go over her shoulders and you would pull it down and it would cause her legs to go out to the side. And that was just so that 
as everything was, you know, getting into place that it stayed where they wanted it to as she was sort of developing a little bit more. So, yeah. And the reason what we're talking about, you guys, is like if you've ever seen a brand new newborn and they go up on their mom's chest, they default to the position that they were in in the womb. So you'll see the babies like with their legs crossed over their butt in the air and their or their arms folded in. Some babies you'll see with their right arm up or something. And that's like how their what their womb position was. And it takes a long time. Like even adults will sometimes sleep with their head turned to the way that they were turned in their womb position. So all of these things, I want to be really clear though that we mention this would have happened whether yeah. Allison had a cesarean delivery yes. or a vaginal delivery. This is what happens when babies sit breech for the entire 40, 42, 43 weeks gestation yeah. that they go to. And so they just need a little bit of extra support physically yeah. as they grow. Which she did tell me. So, yeah, yeah. I just want And also, what I didn't know, which, you know, maybe new moms don't know, is that, you know, they're very pliable. It's not like if our hips were out of the sockets, it's very soft and malleable. So it's just not as like scary as what, like when I first heard that I was afraid to change her diaper. And I remember my, my midwife, who was my birthing coach was in the hospital that day. And she was like, I'm not letting you go home until you put a diaper on that baby. But I was so scared. I was going to hurt her. Right. I was still learning. And it seemed like that would be something that was painful. And of course it wasn't, but I was young and I didn't know. So when they triple diapered her and to kind of keep everything a little tighter until we could get to our first appointment. So ultimately I did change her diaper and yes. <laughs> we all moved on, but you know, you're just scared. You don't know. So I felt like it was important to make sure people knew that too. Cause I just assumed that it was kind of traumatic, but it did not seem to be at all. She was in no pain from that. And yes, the doctor made sure we knew that it was just from being bold in half for so long. So yeah. So tell us about Jade today. So she walks normally. Oh, and... <laughs> yeah, she's she's super athletic and strong. And I mean, it's just one of those things where it's like, you just don't even remember that that happened. It's just a blip on the radar that she kind of looked like, she, you know, her legs were not working correctly to people who didn't know her, but, you know, they were just sort of holding them in place. And she's very strong and long, beautiful, fl- I always call her my flamingo, long, beautiful legs. And yeah, she's perfect. Doing and great. completely, after nine months, they basically sent us home and said, she's good. No more. You're fine. Amazing. Yeah. I want everyone to just hear this because I really wanted to encourage my listeners that you can have a vaginal breach birth safely. Oh, and that yes. choice is really important. And if you choose a C-section, that's okay. But if you choose yes. to go ahead and continue on vaginally, that that's okay too. I think it's really important. My last question for you, Allison, is on birthing in Hawaii with a breech baby. So I've done a lot of research and reading on like birth presentations. And so there's a lot of dialogue about a breech presentation and about the baby who stands strong and faces the world and, you know, that they've chosen to kind of go against um, culture and society and be bold <laughs> and brazen and all these things. Like there, are, if you look at different birthing positions, there is a lot of stuff out there. So I just was curious because Hawaii has so many stories and traditions. And mm-hmm. did your midwife, like, did she say anything to you about what this, how special this was or how cool this was, like, or Hawaii? We talked about it a little bit afterwards because, again, obviously we didn't know during. So I think if we had known, maybe that would be more of a conversation that we would have had. But for sure, what you're saying. And that is definitely how Jade is today. So that would make sense to me. (laughs) Yes. Okay. I love it. So maybe I'll send you a couple articles when we hang up on some of the stuff I've read about this and tap into that for Jade. So the last question that I always, the last, last question that I ask everyone on the podcast, though, is looking back on motherhood, was there a favorite product or service or something that you remember using, thinking, if you found out that you had a friend that was pregnant today, you would say definitely do or get blank. What would that be for you? I used to give this to everybody, and I think they have different versions of it now but it was the battery operated 
nose sucker <laughs> for when they can't breathe instead of shoving the bulb syringe up their nose. Yeah. That thing was such a lifesaver. I know they have the kind with the little sucky thing, you know, they have different versions of it, but I gave that to quite a few people because I just thought it was the best thing ever, you know, yes. to clear their little nose without it being too aggressive. And it like played music. It was awesome. <laughs> I love it. I think the two main brands, I think there's a boogie and then I think there's a nose Frida and I'm sure there's a bunch of other brands out there. Yeah, but they're I'll, wonderful. <laughs> I love it. I'll link to it in the show notes. Allison, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing your story and inspiring others that may be looking at a breech birth. If you at any point in your pregnancy find out that you are breech or your baby is breech, then I encourage you to go to my website at birthstory.com and download the free guide that I have to, let's air quote, flipping a breech baby, right? Some things that we can do to promote your baby to turn to be head down. But if your baby does not turn and maybe you fail an external version, then I really encourage you to seek out a provider who's educated in breech birth and explore breech without borders to find a provider local to you that could support you in your birthing. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next week. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare for the birth you want, no matter